This is the Arctic coast. And Arctic coasts are currently eroding very dramatically. And this is impacting all of us, really all of us, as well as people that live in the north. Now, what I want to tell you in this presentation is why those coasts are so special and why on earth would I be spending my entire summer there doing research? So why is it so special? Well, there is one reason, and that reason is ice. There is ice in the Arctic. There is ice in the sea, as you see on that picture here. There is sea ice on the left here. And that ice is there most of the year, eight months a year. There is only four months in the summer where we don't have ice in the sea. And it's only during those four months that the waves that develop are able to actually attack the coast and erode the sediment at the coast. The other reason why these coasts are so special is because of the presence of ice in the ground. And that ice is permafrost. Permafrost is frozen ground. On that picture here, it's me on the bottom right here, I'm looking at an exposure of permafrost where 98 to 99 percent of the volume is made of pure ice. The rest of the exposure you see here is sediment. Sediment that is bound to carbon, and that is a problem for us. What we know is that a lot of that carbon is released to the atmosphere when permafrost thaws from the top. There is already a lot of literature about this, and we know that. What we don't know, though, is what is happening to all that carbon that is bound on that sediment when it's actually released to the near shore zone, to the coastal zone. That we have no numbers. We know that there is approximately these days about 800 gigatons, 829 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. In permafrost, we have about 1,307 gigatons. That's almost twice that amount. That carbon is frozen. It's there, stored in the permafrost. I told you, we have models, we have data, we know that it's escaping as greenhouse gas to the atmosphere when permafrost thaws from the top. But potentially, coastal erosion could mobilize a lot of that carbon and deliver it to the sea. Now, the theory goes that all of that carbon is released, it's then transported by waves, ends up on the continental shelf, and gets buried there and stays there forever. This is a theory that we wanted to challenge. And why did we want to challenge that? Because Arctic coasts cover a whole part of the globe. Arctic coasts make up one-third, one-third of the coasts of the world. This is very, very substantial. Why is so? It's because we have hundreds of islands. Here, you see that on that map here in Canada, in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. But we have also a very fractal-like shoreline in uh, Greenland, in many of these islands in the north. So, a lot of carbon in that permafrost and very, very long coasts that are prone to erosion. Now, I told you, we have only four months a year where we have waves and data attacking the coast. So we don't expect, actually, too much erosion to occur. This is a data reality. This is Anna Irgang, my PhD student, and uh, the data is hers from her PhD. She's looking at a section, of course, from the northwest part of the Yukon in Canada. Here, ice ridge, you see the permafrost here, you see the ice of the sediment. We measured erosion rates comparing shoreline between the 50s and the 70s and we found an erosion rate of 0.4 meters a year. We found some additional data, imagery, extending until the year 1996. And for that, we found erosion rates at around 0.8 meters a year. We are able to find more information, and then to expand that data set to 2007. And then we found rates extending to 2 meters a year. 2 meters a year is already very substantial. It's much more than virtually anywhere in Germany. Yet, only in four months, you manage to have these rates. But we were also able to expand that data set to 2015. And this is what we found. Very spectacular, very spectacular increase of the erosion rate. We are now in rates closing 8.8 uh, meters a year, and I know from field data that we are now closing the 10 meters a year in that section of coast. 
This is very challenging because the amount of sediment and organic matter, permafrost, carbon that is stored there is immediately released in multiple uh, amounts compared to the numbers that we have before. And it's also very relevant because imagine you're putting a building on top of that coastal section here. It's immediately vulnerable to erosion. So problems that matter globally because of its potential impact on the climate, and that matters locally because of the impact on infrastructure and the local economy. And this is exactly what we're trying to look at in a EU project, a very large EU project I'm coordinating since 2017. That project is called Nunatayuk, it means land sea in Inuvialuktun. And really it's trying to take a holistic view at coastal dynamics in the Arctic. Trying to look at dynamics in the sea, under the sea, on land, but also at the natural and at the social economical frameworks here in the coastal zone. This is quite new and quite innovative, and I could give you thousands of examples of what we are doing, but I want to pick one because this one was released this week in a paper. This is very not spectacular, this is permafrost, and permafrost really, when you look at it, it looks like mud. So what we were trying to do here is really to understand all of that carbon that is released into the sea, does it really disappear? Does it really make it to the shelf untouched and then gets buried there? So what we did is that we took permafrost samples in the field and we brought them back in the lab. We brought them back in the lab and we put them in bottles together with seawater. Very simple experiment. And then we let that water or those bottles lie there for four months. Why four months? Because four months is the approximate duration of our open water season, the season where we don't have sea ice in the summer. And we let them lie there. We were smart enough to put a control. The control is permafrost in the air, if you want, without seawater, because there are already a lot of experiments about permafrost in the air, so permafrost being incubated uh, in atmospheric uh, conditions. And these are the results. What you're going to see are, on the y-axis, the production of CO2 over time, so carbon dioxide, very potent greenhouse gas, and then the time at the bottom on your x-axis. And this is our control. This is what happens when you incubate permafrost in the air. That's a, if you want, a, an allegory for warming, atmospheric warming. You put permafrost, you warm it up, and then you see a very strong production of carbon dioxide. This is linked to the fact that microorganisms become active when it's unfrozen, and then they start releasing a lot of CO2. Now, the state of the art, the literature says this about permafrost in seawater, so potentially permafrost that enters your coastal zone. It says that not much is happening. And that permafrost is escaping to the shelf and getting there buried. What we saw is very different. This is the data. This is brand new. What we saw is actually much of the carbon that was contained in that permafrost exposure is released to the sea, and then there it's converted very quickly to greenhouse gas. And when you think back of the magnitude of the changes you were seeing at the coast and the amounts of carbon that are contained in a permafrost, you make the math pretty quickly. There is a very, very potential large impact on the global climate here that we haven't accounted for. Now, everything I've been telling you until now is very much the way we've been doing science traditionally. Going there in the north, taking samples, bringing them back, analyzing them in the lab and redistributing our knowledge uh, to the whole world. This is great, but this is actually not the way Arctic science should maybe be done. The point is, is that as Western scientists, and in Germany too, we often see the Arctic as this, that coast, desolated, placed, vast environment, beautiful landscape, no one really living there, and it is our mandate as scientists to go there. But there are actually people living there. There are many vibrant communities in the Arctic, people living there, subsisting there, living a life in harmony with land and the sea, relying on the sea and the land for subsistence. And these people have been faced with the issues of erosion for decades. 
not to the magnitude that we are experiencing it now, but they've been devising adaptation strategies, they've been thinking about it before us. And what we need to know is to understand how to collaborate and to engage in partnerships with the people on site. When I'm saying with, it's on purpose. We're not working to redistribute knowledge. We're not working for the people. We are working with the people on site in local communities. This is crucial. Why is it important? Because in the Arctic, in that particular topic, we have lots of communities that are based on permafrost. This is what this map is showing there. And these communities, many of them in Greenland, North America, less in Russia, uh, but in uh, Alaska, you see many of them located at the coast. Small communities, infrastructure being threatened by major natural hazards, hazards related particularly to coastal erosion. This is Richard Gordon. Richard is a an evaluate leader and a mentor and a friend to me. He's very good at making fun of me. And, um, and Richard really is the first one that pushed me to engage with communities in the North. We were doing science the traditional way. Tell me, but why not to go talk to communities? Why not you put like stakeholders, of, stakeholders first and address community priorities? And this is really what we're trying now to do in our project. We are far away, we are in Germany, but there is no excuse not to do it. So what we are doing is slowly building a partnership, a relation of trust, because trust is the most important. And that relation of trust comes through a lot of meetings a lot of conversations, and those conversations are formal or informal. We have consultation meetings, and we have a lot of conversations on Facebook. And believe me, this is really hard to accept for my accounting department when I submit all my Facebook conversations and ask them how to reimburse the bills. But it has been very fruitful. Together, we were able to identify some priorities. One of them that we did again in the PhD thesis of Anna is to look at the vulnerability of cultural sites. I'm saying on purpose cultural and not archaeological here. Those are places that are living places, places where people are hunting, cabins, but also some uh, graves that are located in the landscape. And all of these places are threatened by erosion. What you see on that little uh, picture here is previous coastlines, that's a satellite image, in pink and in blue from the 50s and the 70s. Then you see the current coastline, where 2011 in black, and then projected coastline in dashed yellow and dashed red. The dashed red is very much to the edge of the picture here, um, but the take home message here is that a lot of these sites are threatened by erosion, and that erosion is going to happen very quickly. And the kind of information that we managed to put together here, by combining information on cultural information that we uh, collected together with Inuvialuit and information on erosion, has helped us to uh, shape uh, these uh, results and also to make them a wonderful platform for decision making. My take on message is that the key to all of this is the next generation. We need to engage our students, our PhD students, our young scientists into this kind of um, mental framework when we do research. It is not okay to do research anymore by going there and coming back. We are here to do work in partnership with the Nuvialuit in this case, but I think in general with local stakeholders. And it's really understand, uh, very important to understand our global and our local responsibility. Thank you.